don't really know what's going on. So that's going to be the first strategy that we think about. And I'll show you what I mean. Like I'm gonna apply all of this to um, the test as, as we are taking the test. Um, but what I mean is that you don't have to calculate exactly to get an exact answer. You can estimate based on the numbers that they give you and no ballpark is your answer gonna be in the tens, in the hundreds, in the thirties, in the forties. And then that could help you eliminate answers. It helps you move more efficiently. And it also helps you like double check yourself because if your estimation gives you one answer and then you actually have the extra time to calculate and then you calculate, you get the same answer, you double confirm to yourself. Does that make sense? Um, so there's several sort of reasons why um, uh, estimation works. Um, just give me one second. I'm having like a technical issue. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> so like I was saying, estimation, that's our first strategy. And I'll show you guys how this works. It's easier when we have a sort of a question in front of us. Um, the other thing that I want to focus on is that you guys need to know your formulas. So I have sort of like a formula sheet that I send out to my students and they don't give you any formulas, but there's certain things that you absolutely need to have um, memorized. And those could be both like based on geometry. Mostly those are the formulas. You need to know all your formulas for area and you need to know all your formulas for volume. Um, so I want to review those now. Um, just so just so you have them, right? So I think um, it's really important that you guys know your commonly used squares as well and all your square roots as well. Okay, so let's do, let's do this in order. So let's do formulas for circles. So do you guys know the formula for an area of a circle, circumference of a circle? Yeah, good. I see it coming into the chat. So this is definitely something you guys have to have memorized. We need to know that the area of a circle is pi r squared, like you guys are saying. We need to know that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, which is the same thing as pi times diameter. We also need to know, or I need you guys to know, that pi is approximately 3.14, because sometimes they'll ask you to estimate the answers. So all of that needs to be memorized. Um, you should also be able to manipulate these formulas, right? So they might give you circumference and then you have to solve for radius, right? But you don't need to memorize a new formula for that. It's the same formula. You just need to be comfortable manipulating it. Does that make sense to everybody? And same thing for diameter. So they can ask you any piece of that formula, but I wouldn't go ahead and, and you know memorize a different formula because this one thing um, will give you... Um, all, all of those variables, as long as you know how to solve for it. 
Um, some easier formulas if we're talking about um, like quadrilaterals, which I'm sure you guys know, but just for completeness. Um, we all know that the area of a square is just side squared, or let's just call it length times width, right? Because a square and a, and a, um, a square and a rectangle, sorry, I was missing the word, still gonna be length times width, but for a square, length and width are identical, so it's like side squared. Um, an extra thing for the diagonal of a square that I usually teach, they don't always ask this, but this will give you like a leg up if you need. The diagonal of a square is going to be radical to um, A, where A is the area. So that's an extra formula that can help you. Um, and then the perimeter, we know we just have to add up all the sides. And then you should know that the sum of angles in either a square or a quadrilateral, I mean, either a circle or a quadrilateral is always going to be 360. So we should know this as well. So sum of angles in both circle and quadrilateral equals 360 degrees. This is a quick, quick, quick rundown. Make sure you're asking me any questions about formulas that you're not sure, because all of this should be like straight review. This should all be in your head, um, sort of like ready to go on test day. Does that make sense? And then we have triangles. So this test loves triangles. So triangles is one of their favorite shapes that you guys will be tested on. Um, triangles will definitely, definitely, definitely come up. So we've got a lot of formulas for triangles. And then I also want to review special triangles with you guys. So let's do formulas for triangles. Okay, so the perimeter of any triangle is just the sum of the sides, so I'm not going to write it down. If we have the perimeter of an equilateral triangle, obviously we can just take one side and multiply by three. Does that make sense to everybody? So if they're all the same, we can just take one side and multiply by three. Um, and then with triangles, we have an extra sort of subcategory of right triangles. So I want to do that separately on the next page. We're going to do all the right triangle stuff, all the special triangles, all that kind of stuff. So simple stuff in a triangle, we should know that the sum of angles is going to be 180 degrees. There's a lot of questions that use this simple principle, that the sum of angles is 180 degrees and that a straight angle is 180 degrees. Based on that, you can answer a lot of questions. Um, the other thing that you guys are already saying is that the area of a triangle is just one half base times height. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to memorize this, it makes sense because if we think about a rectangle, we know the area is just base times height. And if we cut this in half, we get two triangles. So we just get one half base times height. Does that make sense? Um, so that's usually how I remember. I'm a big proponent of you don't have to like memorize things outright. If they, if you memorize formulas in a way that makes sense to you, it's a lot easier for you guys to keep this in track, to keep everything sort of in your head. Okay, so now the fun part, let's do all the stuff with right triangles. So right triangles are a big topic on the test. Um, the simple thing is Pythagorean theorem. So you guys should all know Pythagorean theorem. What's Pythagorean theorem? Yeah, perfect. A squared plus B squared plus C squared. Which variable represents my hypotenuse, A, B, or C? Yes, good, good, good. You guys are great. So this is hypotenuse. And how do I know which is hypotenuse? By definition, hypotenuse is always right across your right angle. So hypotenuse, you guys need to know two things about it. It's represented by C in the Pythagorean theorem. It's across the 90 degree angle and it's always the longest side of your triangle. So if you're getting an answer for the hypotenuse and it's shorter than one of your legs, that's a red flag in your head. Light bulb goes off, something's wrong. I made a mistake somewhere. 
um, and that tells you to go back and recheck your, your answer. So this is your hypotenuse. And we said three things about it. It's C in Pythagorean theorem. It's across your 90 degree angle and three longest side. Okay, so I know you guys can all solve for Pythagorean theorem always, but I recommend that we know some of the special right triangle combinations or ratios to watch out for because they're going to come up on the test so often. So you don't have to spend your time sitting there plugging into Pythagorean theorem. You should be able to recognize them and that makes your life kind of a lot easier. Yes, you guys are already putting it in the chat. One of them is the three, four, five triangle, but there's other ratios that I want you guys to know as well. So let's call these right triangle ratios to know. So yes, yeah, so far you guys got three, four, five. Um, the other one that I want you guys to know is five, 12, 13. The other one I want you guys to know is eight, 15, 17. And then the last one I want you guys to know is 7, 24, 25. I haven't really seen them go above this, but there's one trick with this that I also want to tell you guys, any multiple of these works. So if I want to take this and multiply this whole thing by two, six, eight, 10 also works. It's the same thing as three, four, five. If I want to take this and multiply it by three, each of these, I'm going to get nine, 12, 15. That also works. Does that make sense? So you don't have to memorize 6, 8, 10. You don't have to memorize 9, 12, 15. You don't have to memorize 30, 40, 50. Any multiple of 3, 4, 5, as long as you multiply all three of those numbers by the same thing, all of that will work. And that's true for any one of these examples. So you can get a triangle. If I multiply this whole thing by 10, you can get a 50, 120, 130 triangle. And you don't want to spend your time plugging into Pythagorean theorem, thinking about what is 120 squared, what is 50 squared, doing all of that, and taking a square root of some crazy number to get 130. You should be able to recognize this as quickly as possible. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions about this? this idea of multiples. So what I want you guys to really memorize is just this, 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 and know that any multiple of that could be true. And then we'll make a note of this here for our notes. We'll say any multiple of these values works. Okay, and then the other big thing with triangles is special right triangles. So there are two special right triangles that you guys are expected to know. There's the 45, 45, 90 and the 30, 60, 90. Okay, and let me know if I'm going too fast because for me, this is review for you guys, but if it's something new, I can always explain and I can give you an example also. Does that make sense? So you guys can practice and see how you're gonna be tested. So should we start with, let's do 30, 60, 90 first. Okay, so this is a 30, 60, 90 right triangle. Sure, so somebody's confused about the ratio thing, so I can explain. Sure, absolutely. So. What I mean by the ratio thing is you have a right triangle and they'll tell you something like this side is three and this side is five. And then you know that this is a right triangle. So what you're taught to do is go ahead and plug into Pythagorean theorem. So you'll say a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And we know this has to be c because it's our hypotenuse. So, and this has to be either a or b, we don't care. So we'll plug in three squared plus b squared equals five squared. And then we'll say, okay, we know three squared is nine, b squared equals 25. And then we'll subtract nine from both sides. We'll get b squared is 16. We'll square root and we'll get b is four, right? Which is fine, but notice that it took me at least two minutes to get there. And it could take a lot longer if you're trying to figure out like 17 squared, 
or 24 squared, which is something that not all of you guys know. So instead, if you recognize these ratios, if you see a three and a five, you should automatically think, okay, this is a three, four, five triangle, and you know this is four, you don't have to waste your time. So that's the point of memorizing these ratios. Does that make sense? Same exact thing with five, 12, and 13. If you see that this is 13 um, and this is 12, you don't need to think about what this is. You should know automatically this is five without thinking, okay, what's 13 squared? What's 12 squared? Let me subtract that. All of that will save you time. So that, that's why I say memorize the ratios. Okay, so back to the special right triangles. So 30, 60, 90. What do I need to know about a 30, 60, 90 triangle? What are the ratios? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, not one to two to three, but close. So what you need to know is that across your 30 degrees is going to be your X. And across your 90 degrees is going to be 2X. And across your 60 degrees is going to be X radical three. So this could seem overwhelming and crazy. Let me show you guys what I mean by this. Usually the way this works is they'll give you a, a triangle and the, you'll know that this is 30 and this is 60. So you know, first of all, the, the, the key is as soon as you start, right? As soon as you see this, you should think in your head, I know what they're testing me on. They're testing me on special right triangle ratio. So that's the key to doing well in this exam. Figure out what do they want from you? What are they testing you on? Like what's the point of, of, the, of the subject, right? So these ratios, I don't, I don't, you don't get them, you don't derive them, you have to memorize them. Every 30, 60, 90 triangle is going to have sides in this ratio. So the way that it works is as long as they give you one side in a 30, 60, 90 triangle, because you know about those ratios, you can extrapolate all the other sides. So let me show you what I mean. They give you this triangle and let's say they just tell me that this is five. Based on the fact that I know that one side is five and I know the side that's five is across the 30 degree angle, I can figure out all the other sides. So if the side across 30 is five, that represents my X value. That means that the side across 90 degrees is going to be double that. So the side across 90 degrees is going to be two times five or 10. And that means the side across 60 degrees is going to be this value multiplied by rad radical three. So this is going to be five radical three. Is that okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So the idea is they can give you any one of those sides and based on these ratios that we have to memorize, unfortunately, you can extrapolate all the other sides. So let me give you guys, and I'll leave this up on the board so you guys can, um, can use it, and then I'll give you another example. So I'm gonna call this side A, side B, and side C. I'm gonna give you that this is 30, 60, 90. Across 30, let's say, is three. So I want you to tell me what is side A and what is side C. Okay, good. It seems like you guys are getting it. So outside of 90 is going to be six and outside of 60 is going to be three radical three. Where are you? Some people are getting radical 27. Yeah. Oh, three radical. Oh, I see what you guys are doing. You're saying nine, radical nine times radical three. Yeah, you could do that, but this is more simple. Leave it like this. This is probably how you're going to see it on the answer choice. You're not going to see radical 27. Okay, so the key is just to repeat for some people who may be confused or this is the first time they're seeing this, 
the key is that you need to memorize these ratios. These ratios are your key. Um, you're not going to be able to get it without these ratios. So you need to know that across 30 is your X. Across 90 degrees is whatever is across 30 times 2. And then across 60 degrees is whatever is across 30 times radical 3. Okay, now try this one that I put a second example up here. Mm -hmm. Good, you guys are getting it. So for this one, um, we have to go the other way, right? So I made it a little bit harder for you guys. I gave you the side across 90. So this is two times, two times whatever is across 30. So I have to divide by two to get that across 30 is seven. And then across 60 is what's across 30 times radical three. Good. Yes, if this was a question, they would have to give you the angles. These only work, these ratios only work if you know that your angles are 30, 60, 90. Otherwise, you can't use these ratios. So that's a good point. That's a key to getting the answer right. If you see a 30, 60, 90 triangle, your brain should be going, aha, uh -huh, they're testing me on these ratios. You should rack your brain for these ratios. You could even write yourself a little example like this, or you can even give yourself like fake numbers if that helps you. Um, and then go from there and apply it to whatever they they um, ask. Somebody says, how does this equal radical 27? So um, what's a radical form for, how do I get three from a radical? It would be radical nine, right? So radical nine is equal to three. So they're replacing three with radical nine and then they're multiplying it by radical three, getting radical 27. But don't do that. Um, this is more, this is the simplified form. That's how you're going to see it. But just to review radicals, that's how you would get it. Um, and then here are the, here's the ratio, whoever wants to write it down. And I see some people like sporadically asking for notes from last, from Thursday and from today. Again, I'm going to put my email in the chat for everybody. I can't keep track of who's asking. I don't know your emails. So if you just send me an email either right now or after class asking for which notes you want, I'll reply to it with the notes, okay? All right. So... Unfortunately, there's one more ratio that you guys need to know. So the 30, 60, 90 one is not the only one, but I find that the other one is kind of easier to memorize because <clears throat> it's like an isosceles triangle. So the other ratio that you need to know, yeah, somebody put it in the chat already, is 45, 45, 90. So we've got the 90, and then this part is 45, and this part is 45. So what do we know if two angles in a triangle are the same? Angles are always proportional to sides. I don't know if you guys ever learned this, but in any triangle that you have, let's say that this angle is like 27 and let's say this angle is 33 and that will make this angle 120, which makes no sense in, in this example. But let's say, let's say this is true in some way. Um, so what I'm trying to tell you guys is that angles are proportional to the sides they're across. So if this is true, that means that this side here is the longest, and this side here is the second longest, and this side here is the shortest. So angles are always proportional to the side that they're across. So the same is true here. What we know is that because these two angles are the same, 45 and 45, by definition, these two sides have to be the same. So this is going to be X and X. And then um, across 90 degrees, you should know that it's X radical two. So that's the ratio anytime you have a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And then here I'll write down sides are proportional to the angles across them. Okay, so let's just do some quick practice with this to make sure that you guys know what I'm talking about. So let's say they give you that this is 45 and they only have to give you that one angle is 45, right? Because remember we learned that the sum of angles is 180. So then that automatically means you guys can figure out that this is 45 and same thing with 30, 60, 90 triangle. If they give you that one angle is 90 and the other angle is 30, they don't have to tell you the last angle is 60. So you can extrapolate that. 
Um, but as soon as you see 130 or 160 or 145, you know what they're testing you on. So they give you something like this and they tell you that this is four. Um, and then they tell you what is side AB and what is side AC. Okay, so try these and then we'll review. Yeah, so good, you guys are getting it. So this will be four also, right? Because we're dealing with an isosceles. This will be four radical two. And here, these are both 10, 10, 10. Okay, so if you guys understand this, remember back when I put the diagonal of a square uh, formula, you guys should now have a better understanding of that because look what happens if we have a square. And in a square, these are all equal, right? These are all 90, 90, 90, 90, right? Just by definition, that's what a square is. So if I go ahead and I make a diagonal here like this, what happened? I just created two 45, 45, 90 triangles, right? Because I cut the square exactly in half. This used to be 90. So now this is 45 and 45. And these two sides are equal. So I'm dealing with an equal 45, 45, 90 triangle. So we can just apply, yeah, the lines on the sides mean equal. So now we can just apply what we learned, right? All of this is side, 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 side of the square. And then this is going to be side radical two. Same ratio, same 45, 45, 90 triangle. Does that make sense? So you guys need to know that they can test this in more ways than one. So it can come up with just a triangle and they'll tell you 45, 45, 90, but it could also come up with the diagonal of a square. And then somebody was confused with this, how we got 10 here. So again, go back to your ratios. If they're telling you that across 90 is 10 radical two, um, across the other sides, we have to get rid of the radical two. Look at this example that I gave you, x, x, x radical two. So 10, 10, 10 radical two. But because I gave you the 10 radical two and not the tens, you had to work backwards on that example. Okay, guys, any questions? Is this, is this helpful? So far, so good? Okay, good. Um, so I wanna do, let's see what I wanna do. I wanna do a few more things with you guys and then get to real questions. Um, I want you guys to, let's see what, what I wanna do. Okay, so there's certain things like commonly used square roots, commonly used squares, commonly used percents, decimals that I want you guys to have memorized. So I wanna quickly run through it. It's not anything like teaching, but I want you guys to have like a solid page of notes that you can go back to and look over before your test. So that's what we'll spend five minutes doing now. Um, and then you guys can take notes on this. Um, so again, this isn't like mandatory, right? You don't have to memorize this to do well, but if you do, your life becomes a lot easier because you don't get a calculator um, and a lot of these things repeat. So let's do commonly used squares first. So I recommend that you guys memorize from one squared, which is obviously just one, all the way to 25 squared. So
these are the ones that I recommend memorizing because they're going to show up. So obviously, I know that most of you know these first few ones. These come up all the time. These are pretty easy for you guys. But this is around where we get into trouble. Who knows 13 squared? Yeah, fill these in. Fill the rest of them in. Put them in the chat first, and then I'll, and then I'll fill them in. Yeah, good. So 13 squared, most of you got 169. 14 squared is 196. So easy to memorize because look, these numbers just flip. So that's always how I memorized it between um, 13 and 14. And then 15 squared is 225. And we have 256. And we have 289. And this is where people really start getting confused. So 18 squared is 324. This is 361. And we've got 400 and 625. So again, you don't need to have this memorized to do well, but if you have 17 squared and you're sitting there and you're going 17 times 17, okay, seven times seven is nine, carry the four, and you're doing all of this, you're spending time. So this is all about streamlining your thought process and making you more efficient. Because if you can save those few seconds on 17 squared, you can then apply those few seconds to a question that you actually don't understand. Because 17 squared, you guys all understand. It's just a matter of how long it takes you to get there. Does that make sense? So that's why I recommend sort of like memorizing this baseline. They really won't go, won't go above that. The last number is 25 squared, which is 625. And then you want to do the same thing backwards, right? The square roots, but I'm not going to rewrite them because it's all the same stuff. So you should know this way forward, but if they ask you the square root of 361, we should also know that's 19. Um, so I'm not going to rewrite that, but I want you guys to gather that obviously this is a two-way street. So you should know squares and you should know square roots. So same idea for square roots. Um, and then the other thing is commonly used like decimals and percents. So let's just review some of those as well. Okay, so we should know that one sixth is about 0.167. And then percent is going to be about 16.7%, obviously. And then you should know that one third is 0.33 or about 33%. Two thirds is just double of that. So 0.67 or 66.7%. Five sixths is 0.833 or 83.3%. One eighth you should know is 0.125 or 12.5%. And then three eighths is 0.375 or 37.5%. Five eighths is 0.625. Oh no. Um, and then these are simpler. I'm sure you guys all know these. So one fifth, you should just know is 0.2 or 20%. And two fifths is just double that 0.4 or 40%. Three fifths is going to be 0.6 or 60%. And then finally, four fifths is 0.8 or 80%. Um, so again, you don't have to memorize these, but again, they're going to make you more efficient, make you go faster on the exam. A lot of these you guys just know based on just practice and seeing them. Um, but a lot of them, like these, most students don't have memorized, but it's just a step, just gives you that extra edge because you go a little bit faster. And the other thing that can help you is like, you don't need to memorize all of them. As, as long as you know one third, you can easily get that two thirds is double, double that. As long as you know one fifth, you don't need to memorize the rest of these. Does that make sense? Um, but just give yourself an idea to save yourself time and all of these little things that when you add it up, these little things take a lot of time on, on your test. Okay, so the other few things that I want to review with you guys is um, 
Let's do exponents. Okay, let's do exponents and let's do let's do exponents and angles and then let's do practice problems and whatever else comes on during the practice problems or any questions or topics you guys want me to do okay i'm trying to cover the big things that i know definitely come up okay let's do exponents Sure, somebody asked me to go back for the notes. Okay, so laws of exponents, what do we need to know? So most of the things you guys can do with exponents depends on if the exponent has the same base. So what do I mean when I say base? So you guys should know that every single ex any, any um, exponent question that we're working on has a base, which is this, and has an exponent, right? So that's just vocabulary. It's important to know what we're talking about. So you can manipulate exponents that have the same base. When exponents don't have the same base, you can't really do much to manipulate them. So when exponents have the same base, we can do a bunch of things. So for example, if we have x to the a power, and we're multiplying by x to the b power, we can combine this into one thing and we can say, okay, this is the same thing as x to the a plus b power. So when you're multiplying exponents with the same base, you can add the exponent. So let's do a real life example. If we have three to the second power times three to the fourth power, this is the same thing as saying three to the sixth power. And the reason it works is if you write this in long form, three to the second power just means three times three, and three to the fourth power means three times three times three times three. So we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, three to the sixth power. So I like doing that. I like explaining why the rule works because then you guys remember it better. So you don't have to just memorize willy nilly, add the exponent, you prove to yourself that it works and then all other times you can just follow the rule. Um, the rule is similar for when we're dividing exponents with the same base. So if you have x to the a power divided by x to the b power, instead of adding the exponents, we subtract. So this ends up x to the a minus b power. Um, the other rule is if we have x to the a power and this whole thing is risen to the next power, we can multiply. So this is the same thing as x to the a times b power. Um, and the other thing is true, like exponents, you can um, distribute them. So if we have something like x to the y to the seventh power, this is the same thing as x to the seventh times y to the seventh. So exponents are distributable as well, whether you're multiplying or whether you're dividing. So if we have something like x over y to the seventh power, it's the same thing as x to the seventh over y to the seventh. And then finally, you guys should be comfortable with sort of flip-flopping between fractional exponents and roots. And that's used to be something that really confused me. Um, but this is something that can you can memorize. So if you have x to the power of a over b, you can transfer this into a root. So your denominator of your exponent goes into here, your base stays the same, and your numerator becomes the new exponent. So the way that I usually remember it is that x to the one half power is the same thing as the square root of x. There's like an invisible two here that you don't have to write, an invisible one here because you don't have to write. But this is the, the main one that I memorize um, that can help me work through any exponent problem. Okay, and then the last thing that I wanna cover with you guys before we sort of move on and do practice questions 
is just some laws of angles, just a quick review. Um, so we need to know that the number of angles in any polygon is always going to be n minus two times 180. So number of degrees in any polygon is n minus two times 180 degrees. And n is what? n is always the number of sides. So if we try this with a triangle, three minus two is one, one times 180 is 180. So we know that number of the degree, the sum of angles in a triangle is 180. Um, you can also flip this formula and figure out what each angle in a regular polygon mentions. Uh, who knows what a regular polygon is? Yeah. So whenever you guys see the word regular, that means that um, all sides are equal by definition. Yeah, it means all sides are equal. Um, a few other rules that you guys should know is that always all vertical angles are congruent. Number of angles is always going to equal number of sides. All right, think about it. In a triangle, we have three angles and three sides. And by vertical angles, we know what we mean. Anything that crisscrosses, so this is equal and this is equal. Um, and then you guys should know that all complementary angles add up to 90 degrees and all supplementary angles add up to 180 degrees. So you should know that vocabulary. If they use that vocabulary in a word problem, you should know what it means. So complementary adds up to 90. So visually, they will also look like a right angle. And supplementary is a straight angle, 180. So visually, it'll look straight as well. And in case they give you um, like a picture. OK, and then I'm sorry. I know there's like a lot to review. One last thing that I wanted to cover is formulas for solids, like volume um, and surface area. And then after that, we'll get to practice problems, OK? And then at the end, I can do like any other topics that I didn't really cover that you guys are unsure of. So let's do formulas for solids. Um, so you know that volume of a cube is side cubed, similar to how area of a square is side squared. Volume of a regular rectangular solid is length times width times height. And then volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. So somebody said they can't see the formulas on the screen. Is that true for everybody or just for that one student? You guys cannot see or you can see? Oh, you guys can see. Okay, good. So whoever can't see, 
Um, it must be like a technical glitch. Either give it a few seconds or you can leave and come back. I'll let you back in. Um, and then hopefully that resolves it. Um, okay, and then we need to also know the volume of a sphere. Four third pi r cubed. Okay, um, and then some like logical things which like sometimes come up is the number of like sides, edges, um, vertices. So you should know that um, there are six faces in a, in a cube. There's going to be eight vertices and 12 edges. So six faces, eight vertices, 12 edges. Okay, and then let's do surface area. So let's do surface area of a sphere. Um, that's going to be four pi r squared. Surface area of a rectangular solid and a cube. Um, you guys don't really need a formula. You could derive the formula, but you could also just think about it's going to be the area of one face. So side times side, and then multiplied by six, right? Because there's six faces for a cube. Um, same thing for, um, for a rectangular solid, you'll get the area of these two multiplied by two, the area of these two multiplied by two, the area of these two multiplied by two. Does that make sense? So it ends up being like two times length width plus two times length height plus two times width height. So we could write it down, but again, I'm a big proponent of like only memorizing formulas that you absolutely need. The other ones you can sort of derive. So this is going to be six sides squared. And then surface area of a rectangular solid is going to be two length times width plus two length times height plus two width times height. But again, these you don't have to memorize, you can derive. Um, for the volume of a right triangular prism, what you're going to do is you're going to find the volume of the base. Um, and then um, you're going to multiply it by the height. I mean, you're going to find the area of the base, sorry, and then you're going to multiply it by the height. This is just rectangular solid, just shorthand, sorry. So let's also write it down just for completeness. You can have volume of a right triangular prism. Uh, where you're gonna get volume is base times height, where the B is the area of the base. I feel like I'm confusing guys. So the this is just rectangular solid. And then finally you can get volume of a right circular cone. Um, and that's going to be <clears throat> one third pi r squared h where R is obviously the radius of the circular base and H is the height of the cone.
Um, and then surface area of a cylinder is going to be 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared. So in my experience, the most common ones that they will ask you guys on um, is like all of these, these volumes. And then I've seen them ask surface area of just these three. All of this stuff down here, maybe surface area of a cylinder too. But these two, I just put for completeness sake, it's like pretty unlikely that this will come up. All right, are you guys ready to do practice? And then whatever else comes up, we can do like a little mini lesson on the practice as well. Um, and then at the end, I'll try to save some extra time. This is surface area of a cylinder. I'm sorry, my picture is. So this is the area of the base. So the area of the base is gonna be one half base times height. And then you take this area, you plug it in as the B and then you multiply by the height of the whole prism. All right, let's do some practice. Okay, so the first one says the figure below shows a circle with a hole in the middle. The outer diameter is one and one fourth inches and the diameter of the hole is one fourth. And they write that out for us. And they want the area of the shaded region to the nearest hundredth of a square inch. Okay, so we know the area formulas, right? So we just reviewed those. So this is simply area is pi r squared. And you're gonna find the area of the big circle, the area of the little circle and subtract. So we're gonna have area is pi, and then our radius here first we need to figure out. So if our diameter is one and one fourth, first we need to figure out what our radius is. So we would take one and one fourth and we would divide it by two. So one and one fourth is the same thing as um, five fourths or 10 eighths. So we have 10 eighths divided by two, and that's the same thing as five eighths. So we have, pi 5 eighths squared minus pi um, 1 eighth squared. Does that make sense to everybody? So then when we simplify, we get pi 25 over 64 minus pi 1 over 64. And then this just simplifies to pi 24 over 64. Um, and then we can, we can simplify further, 24 and 64 um, are both divisible by eight. So then this becomes pi times three eighths. And then finally, we just have to do three eighths times um, 3.14. And then if you guys remember, we just reviewed in our little list here, that 3 eighths is 0.375. Where is it? Just to show you guys right here. So this is how this comes up, right? So now I don't have to think about what 3 eighths is. I know that it's 0.375. So then that saves us that extra time. We do 0.375 times 3.14. So if this was a multiple choice question, I wouldn't actually do this math. I would say, okay, about 0.4 times three, um, that's gonna give me about 1.2. So I know my answer is somewhere close to 1.2 and then I'll find, the, um, I'll find the answer choice that's close to 1.2. Unfortunately, this is one of those where you have to fill in. So in this case, you would go ahead and you would actually multiply and you would get that your answer is 1.175, which is pretty close to 1.2. Um, 
Um, but then um, always look at what they're asking you. They want hundredth of a square inch. So if you bubble this wrong, you got the whole thing right and you're going to get the answer wrong. So you have to make sure that you round this to the hundredth, which is the second place, and they want 1.18. Yeah, 3.14 is always pi. Um, sometimes you can leave it in terms of pi, um, but sometimes like in this case, when you bubble in, there's no pi symbol. So if it's for like a short answer, that's why they make you do it to a decimal. But in the multiple choice, oftentimes they'll leave the answer in terms of pi. Fraction form of pi is 22 over seven. Okay, let's do the next question. So next question we have, um, okay, so a lot of questions in the chat, let's see. So somebody said, should I use 3.14, 22.7? It's preference, but in this case, they asked us for the nearest decimal. So it makes more sense for you to just convert to decimal right away. Use 3.14 because if you use 22.0 over 7, you're then going to get a fraction answer, and then you have to spend those extra few seconds converting your fraction answer to the decimal um, to plug it in because they specifically said you want they wanted to the hundredth. So they're telling you, give me an answer in a decimal. Question 59, we're going to do together just now. And when you start bubbling in, you start bubbling in from left to right. Yes. And they're going to be numbered also. Um, so you can confirm how you're bubbling. All right, let's look at 59 together. So it says, um, a homeowner has a budget of $135 for the installation of a light fixture. Electrician charges 60 per hour plus a one-time trip charge of 45. So as you guys are reading this, you should be thinking of like a equation in your head right away. So another big strategy is when you're dealing with word problems, you should be able to convert the word problem into a numerical expression almost instantly. That's the key to getting these right. So 60 per hour, whenever you see per, this is like the idea of like almost like slope, um, slope or rate, that's a key word, right? So that's going to be your slope um, per hour with a one-time trip charge of 45. So this is going to be 60, times x or times hours times some variable plus 45. And then it says, what is the greatest amount of time and hours they can work in order to keep to the budget? So greatest amount of time. So this, and we need this to be 135 as close as possible, but we need it to be less than or equal to 135 because that's my, that's my sort of upper limit. That's my budget. I can't go above that. Does that make sense? So I can't make it greater than because I, I can't go above 135. I have no more money, not a single pe penny more. So it either has to be 135 exactly or somewhere lower than that. So this is how we would set up our equation. And then after that, the key is just to learn. So you have two numbers here, right? 60 and 45. You guys should all know y equals mx plus b. If you see a word problem with per, um, you're most likely going to be using this formula. So all of these are hints. And the number that's near the per is going to be your slope. And then the other number becomes this variable. And then this is always what you're solving for. So that's kind of just a rundown of how to think through these problems if it doesn't come naturally to you. And then once you have this set up, that's the, you did all the hard work. Now you just need to solve. So we're gonna subtract 45 from both sides. We're gonna get 60 X is equal to 90. Then we're gonna divide both sides by 60. This goes away. And then these are both divisible by three. So we get three over two which is just 1.5. And again, they tell you to report your answer as a decimal, so do not bubble in three over two. So yes, our answer is that X has to be less than or equal to 1.5, which means the greatest thing that X can be is 1.5, but X could also be 1.4, 1.3, 1 1.2, 1, one, anything less than that. Okay, and then the last one on this page, we have the list shows the daily low temperatures in a city during six days in the winter. What is the difference between the lowest and the highest temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit for these six days? So we just need to find the highest temperature and the lowest temperature. So the highest temperature here is seven and the lowest temperature is negative five. So we just need to do seven minus negative five 
Two negatives make a positive, we get 12. So this one is pretty simple. You just have to be careful because there's some negatives here. So you could look quickly and say, oh, one's the smallest number I see, but you know that with negatives, negatives are smaller, obviously. No, 1.5 is the right answer. Maybe, where did you put in 1.50? Like on, a, on, on Queller's practice test? So it was, um, So if the 1.50 was wrong on Queller's practice test, you can give your answer back. It's probably because when we put it into the computer, we just wrote 1.5, but 1.50 is the equivalent. Um, they wouldn't take off points on the real test for that. And then what's the question here? Okay. So somebody's asking, wouldn't 60 be negative five minus seven? That's not correct. They're asking the difference between the lowest and the highest temperatures. That doesn't mean that you start with the lowest and then you do the highest. You just want the, the difference between them. Does that make sense? So if you imagine like a number line and plotting them, the lowest, this is zero. The lowest would be somewhere here, negative five seven, they're asking you, what is this space? Okay, we have two more of these and then we'll go to the uh, multiple choice. So this says a grocery store sells one gallon containers of milk for $3.99. Stores also sells orange juice in a six pack of 5.5 fluid ounces bottles for $1.79. Suppose the store wants to sell its orange juice in gallon containers instead. To the nearest dollar, how much more would a gallon of orange juice cost than a gallon of milk? Okay, so first we need to think about the gallon. What is the cost of a gallon of orange juice? So first we need to think, what is the total amount of ounces in a six pack? So in a six pack, there are six bottles, each 5.5 fluid ounces. So all together, it's 5.5 times six or 33 ounces. Yeah, good. So all together, it's 33 ounces. So now we know that 33 ounces of OJ cost us one seventy nine. So next we need to know how many ounces are in a gallon. So this is a conversion you guys have to know. So they tell you they we should know that in one gallon there are one hundred and twenty eight ounces. So now we're going to set up a proportion. We're going to say okay thirty three ounces cost one seventy nine. How much does one twenty eight ounces cost? This is going to be our x. And then you guys should know that with any proportion, we do a little cross multiplication action like this. So to solve this, we're gonna get 33 X is equal to 128 times 1.79. We're gonna cross multiply, we're gonna multiply this. You're gonna get 33 X is equal to 229.12. And then we have to divide both sides by 33. And we're gonna get that X is going to be, so this is an example of when I would estimate, right? Actually, we can't really estimate because this is still the, the fill-in, but if this was a multiple choice, this is where I would estimate. I would say, okay, 229 is about 230, and this is about 30. So that's how I would think about it. And I'd say, okay, 210 divided by 30 is going to be seven. Um, 230 divided by 33 should be a little bit less than seven. So I would estimate maybe like six something. Does that make sense? When you actually divide this, it ends up being 6.94. And then they want the difference between a gallon of OJ and a gallon of milk. So you would have to do 694 minus 399. And this becomes 2.95, which is to the nearest dollar three.
And again, make sure that you answer the question they want. They want to the nearest dollar. So do not bubble this in. If you bubble this in, you'll get the wrong answer. So it will take you the most time to do all the math and these short answer problems. And then you can start skimping and kind of using estimation when you get to the multiple choice. But with these, they want an exact answer. And then, okay, finally, the last one. So we have the box plot shows the average monthly high temperatures in New York City for 12 months. What is the difference between the range and the interquartile range? So this is testing your ability to like know, um, to know how to like work with the box plot, right? So the range is by definition, the highest minus the lowest, right? So the range by definition is going to be our highest minus lowest or our maximum minus our minimum. So our maximum value here is 84 and our minimum value here is, looks like 39. So our range is going to be 84 minus 39 and that's gonna give us 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's our range. And then the next thing they want is the interquartile range. So the interquartile range is going to be the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. So the upper quartile is right here at 78. And the lower quartile is right here, it's 48. So then our interquartile range is going to be 78 minus 48 or just 30. And then finally, they want the difference between 45 and 30. So that's really easy. It's 45 minus 30, which is just 15. So somebody said, what if you estimated and you got 38 instead of 39? It's like, I don't know what to say, really unfortunate mistake. Um, I will say maybe on the real test, they'll be a little bit more specific, but this is also very close. So I would say it does look more like um, 39 than 38. You also have to imagine that there's going to be a 37 here and then a 38. So it really does look more like 39. So unfortunately, that would just count as, as wrong. They wouldn't give you leeway with that. Okay, let's go to the multiple choice. Okay, prime factorization. They love their prime factorization. The way that I like to do this is I always do a factor tree. So I would start with 756. Um, I like doing, uh, if, it's a, um, if it's an even number, I always start with two because I think it's easy. You don't have to think about any other factors. So it would be two and 378. And then lucky for us, it's still even. So we would do two and 189. Um, and then if you guys remember 189, <clears throat> then is divisible by three and 63. And then 63 is divisible by nine and seven. And then this is just divisible by three and three. So the idea is you keep kind of breaking this down until you can't anymore, until all your last numbers are prime. So these are our prime numbers, two, two, three, 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 seven. And then we count how many of each we have. So we have two twos, so we have two squared. So far I can't eliminate anything. And then we have three threes, three cubed. At this point, I don't care, I stop. There's only one answer with three cubed. The other thing that you can do is if you are running out of time, you don't have time to do this, immediately 21 is not a prime number, right? This is divisible by seven and three, so that's not gonna be our prime factorization. 27 is not a prime number, divisible by nine and three, not our prime factorization. This is three and three, not it. So even without actually spending time, you can automatically see that D is your right answer. But if you wanted to actually do it, this is how you would do it. Okay, next they say, what is the value of the expression above? And if they tell you what X is and if they tell you what Y is. So your idea here is we would substitute for X and Y. So we're gonna substitute negative two squared and then two to the sixth power. And then down here, we're gonna substitute negative two and then two squared. Um, and then we simplify. So look what happens here. We can get rid of things, right? So 
using the exponent rules that we just reviewed, we have an invisible one here, right? So this is going to be like just looking at this, this becomes x squared over x, which is just x. And this becomes y to the sixth over y to the second, which is just y to the fourth. So this whole thing simplifies to x, y to the fourth. And then when you plug that in, you get negative two times two to the fourth power. So then you get negative two and two to the fourth power is 16. So your answer ends up being negative 32. So it's your choice if you want to simplify with the variables or if you want to simplify after you plug in. I think it's easier to simplify with the variables because the two and the negative two can get kind of messy. But the idea is the same, right? So the ones that have the same bases, this is quotient rule. So when dividing exponents with the same bases, we subtract the exponents. So that's what we're doing here. Okay, next we have if eight divided by m plus four is 20, what is the value of m? So this is just the simple equation, right? So we can just solve. The goal is to isolate our variable, right? So this is the basic principle of algebra. We want to get m alone. So how do we get m alone? First, we need to get rid of this. And the way that we isolate our variable is we do opposite operations. So the four is being added. So I wanna get rid of the four. So I'm gonna subtract the four from both sides. So now I have eight divided by M is equal to 16. Okay, so now what do I do? I wanna multiply both sides by M. I'm gonna multiply both sides of my equation by M. On this side, it disappears. So I just get eight. And on this side, I get 16 times M. And again, the goal is to isolate my variable. So I want M alone. M is attached to the 16 with what operation? Multiplication. So to isolate it, I'm gonna do the opposite operation. I'm gonna divide both sides by 16. And there we go, we got our answer, eight over 16, which simplifies to one half. Next one is another equation. So again, the goal is always to um, combine all of our like terms and then isolate our variable. So right now we can't isolate our variable because it's on both sides of the equation. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna consolidate. I want only one side of my equation to have my variable. So I'm gonna subtract X from both sides. And now I'm gonna get five X and be careful, do not lose this negative, it is going to be negative 1,680. So at this point, I know my answer is going to be negative. So I can get rid of this and I can get rid of this. Um, and so I know my answer is either going to be this or this, and this is when I would estimate, right? So if you know, if you multiply five by 300, that's going to be about 1500, right? But if you multiply five by 200, that's only going to be about a thousand. So we know that this has to be our answer because our number is greater than 1500. Does that make sense? So at this point, I wouldn't sit here and I wouldn't say, okay, 1680 divided by five, this goes into five, three times, or you can just do that. And as long as you see that your first answer is three, you pick H right away. Does that make sense? You don't need to keep going. That's what I meant by the first rule is estimation. Save. you're gonna shave a few seconds off, whether you um, estimate that way or you start to divide. And just by the first number, you know what your answer is already. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, any questions so far? You guys are okay? Okay, let's keep going. So number 67, we have a person buys a used car with a down payment of 1200 and makes monthly payment of 275 for three years. Okay, so we're paying 275 per month. So remember per always means multiply. So now we got to figure out, okay, well, how many months went by? So three years went by. You guys should all know that in one year, there's 12 months. So in three years, we're going to have 36 months. So that means that he's pay, paid $1,200. That's his down payment plus 275 
for 36 months. Um, so now we need to think, okay, so what's our answer here? So what can we do? First of all, there's no way that it's going to be 2025, right? We're already giving a down payment of 1200. And now let's estimate what this could possibly be. This we can round up to 300. And this we can round up, round down to 30. So my rule with estimation is if you're rounding one number up, you should multiply the other number down to sort of like um, rebalance yourself. So you don't overestimate, you don't underestimate. That way you're closer. So this becomes approximately $9,000. So we have approximately $9,000 plus approximately $1,200. So that's going to give me approximately $10,200. But the closest here is going to be this. Does that make sense? And that way you don't have to spend, spend the time. Okay, next we have a parallelogram and they want the value of X. Okay, so how are we gonna think about this? So the rule that you need to know here to get this answer correct is that in a parallelogram, any two adjacent angles are supplementary. So let's, that, let's write that down for ourselves. So in any parallelogram, any two adjacent angles, are supplementary. And we went over what supplementary means. That means they add up to what, 90 or 180? Yeah, good, 180. So basically what that means is any adjacent angle. So these are adjacent, these are adjacent, these are adjacent, these are adjacent. But the two they gave us are adjacent. So what we know is that 3x plus 2x is equal to 180. Now these are like terms. So 3x and 2x adds up to 5x. And then if we divide both sides by five, um, we get our value of x, which is 36. And again, if this is hard math for you, where you would have to go ahead and divide, you could think, okay, what do I know that's easy? I know that 150 divided by five is 30. And I know that 30 divided by five is six. And 150 plus 30 gives me 180 and 30 plus six gives me 36. So any fast arithmetic is always gonna help you because you don't have a calculator here. Does that make sense? So start training your brain to work that way in order to work more efficiently and faster on this exam. Okay, let's see, what do we have next? A bus begins its trip with our occupants, including the driver. At each of the 20 stops, three people get on and no one leaves. There are three times as many bus occupants at the end of the 20th stop as there are at the end of the fourth stop. How many oh, did they have immediately after the 10th stop? So they love their questions like this, where it's like a little bit of logical reasoning, a little bit confusing. So what we want to do is we want to turn this into a formula. So I want to think about how many occupants are there after 20 stops. So we're starting, we are beginning our trip with R. So we're beginning with R. And then at each of the 20 stops, we're adding three more people. So we're adding 20 times three. So at the end of the 20th stop, we have 60 more people than we started with. So we get 60 plus R. So then the question is, well, what are we at the end of the fourth stop? So at the end of the fourth stop, we have R plus four times three or R plus 12. So the difference between those two things um, is the 12 and the 60. So what do we do from here? So now we want to show that the number of occupants after 20 stops is three times as many as after the fourth stop. So how do we do that? So now we have to say, well, after the 20th stop, which is R plus 60, that's equal to three times as many as after the fourth stop, which we defined as R plus 12. 
So the hard part is just orienting all of this. The easy part is solving this. So you're going to use your distributive property. You're going to say r plus 60 is equal to 3r plus 36. Then we're going to do subtract r from both sides. We're going to get 60 is equal to 2r plus 36. We subtract 36 from both sides. We're going to get 2r is 12. And then we're going to get r, sorry, 2r is 24. And then we're going to get r is 12. Does that make sense to everybody or is that a little confusing? Okay, let's let's redo it together. Okay. So at the end they say that there are three times as many bus occupants at the 20th stop as there are at the fourth stop. So the way that I would write an expression of that is I would say 20th stop is equal to three times fourth stop, right? And I got this expression just based on this that I'm highlighting. Unfortunately, there's no variables here, right? So I can't solve any of this. So now I need to think, okay, so how am I going to describe who's at the 20th stop and who's at the fourth stop? So at the 20th stop, I know that I'm starting with our people in the beginning with no stops. And then at every stop, I'm adding three people and I'm doing it 20 times, right? So three times 20. And then how do I describe the fourth stop? So again, I'm starting with our people and I'm adding three people. How many times? Four times. And then we just have to solve. So we get r plus 60 is equal to 3r plus 12. And then just solve. So just distribute this. We get r plus 60 is equal to 3r plus 36. Subtract r from both sides. We get 60 is equal to 2r plus 36. Subtract 36 from both sides. And then we get 2r is 24. And then finally, r is 12. Oh, you guys are right. You guys are right. So I solved for R. I made the mistake. Yes, 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 yes. You guys are right. So I solved for R. R is 12, but that's not what they're asking us. They're asking us how many occupants after the 10th stop. So the last thing we need to do is we need to plug in. So then after the 10th stop, we have, we're starting with R plus 10 times three people are added every stop. Now we know what R is. So we just plug that in. So we get 12 plus 30. You guys are right. The answer is 42. So don't do what I just did. Don't fall for the mistake. Sometimes you solve for the end of the variable and then that's it, you think you're done. Always go back to the question. Good job. Okay, let's see, next one. We have J sold N tickets. Pillar sold three times as many tickets as J did. So we have J is N and Pillar is 3N. Together, J and Pillar, so together, J and Pillar sold 10 more tickets than Amy. So now we just replace. So N plus 3N is equal to 10 plus Amy. So 4n is equal to 10 plus Amy, but they want an expression for Amy. So they're telling you like solve for a alone. So now I just need to subtract the 10 from both sides. We get 4n minus 10 as our answer. Next, it says, for what values of x is the expression above, is the inequality above true? So let's solve for x. Divide both sides by 6, and we get that negative 2 is greater than x, or x is less than negative 2, which is choice C. Um, so be really careful with these. You have to flip the inequality sign only if you're dividing or multiplying by a negative.
So here they could have tried to confuse you because this number is negative, but you only care if the number you're dividing by is negative. That's the only time you would flip the sign. Okay, next they want what is the value of x in terms of y. So whenever you see an expression of what is the value of blah, blah, blah in terms of blah, 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 they're saying solve for x. So they're saying solve for x. They're saying isolate x. Combine all the y's and solve for x. So that's our goal when we're doing this. Um, other than that, you're going to solve this as a regular expression. So you're going to combine um, any like terms that you can. You're going to distribute. So first, let's distribute. We're going to have 5x minus 30y is equal to 50y. And then we can combine our like terms. So I can add 30y to both sides. So we're going to get 5x is equal to 80y. And then they want x alone. So I'm going to divide both sides by 5. Um, and I'm going to get my answer, which is x is 16y. Another way that you can realize that they're telling you to solve for x is all your answer choices only have y in them. So that's another hint to you that they're telling you, like, get rid of the x, solve for x, tell me what x equals, leave it in terms of y. Okay, they're saying all of the corners are right angles. What is the perimeter? <laughs> so... We know all the sides, but we don't know this and we don't know this. So first order of business is to figure that out. So if we know this is six and this is three, we can extrapolate that this is going to be three. And then if we know that this is five and we know this piece here is two, we can extrapolate that this will be three. And then this will be three as well. Does that make sense? Um, so now we know all of our, um, we know all of our things. So now what we have to do is we would find the perimeter of all of this and then we would use the scale. Does that make sense to everybody? So the key is remembering to use the scale. So now let's add up all the lengths. So we're going to do 6 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 or plus 2. Or you could just plus 5. It doesn't matter. Same thing. Um, so when we add all of this up, we get 22. And then we have a scale. So we know that 1 half inch is 25 feet. But we want to know, well, how much is 22 inches? It's going to be x feet. And anytime you have a proportion, you want to cross multiply like this. So we're going to have 1 half x is equal to 22 times 25. Um, so then 1 half x is equal to 550. And then we multiply both sides by 2 to get the answer of 1100. And if it's easier for you guys not to do the 22 times 25, you could also multiply by two right away. And then you can just get two times 22 times 25. Um, we know that this is easily 50 times 22. And then you know that this is going to be about a thousand, a little bit greater than a thousand. Um, and you can do this. Does that make sense? So big proponent of, oh, never mind. You got it. I was going to redo it. Okay. So anytime you can save yourself time, save yourself time. Okay, um, next we have Maria rides her speed at a, con at her, oh, sorry, Maria rides her bike to school at a constant speed of 15 miles per hour. What do we know? That it's going to be 15 times the number of hours she's riding. If the distance to school is six miles, how many minutes does it take her to get to school? So she rides 16, 15 miles per hour, but we just need a distance of six miles. So her speed is 15 miles per hour. So 15 miles to one hour. We also know that one hour is 60 minutes. So 
that means it takes her 60 minutes to ride 15 miles. But we want to know how many minutes will it take her to ride six miles. So we can set up a proportion. We can say, okay, 15 miles is 60 minutes. I want to know how long six miles will take her. So this is X. And I always line up my variables, right? So I have miles, miles, minutes, minutes. And you can line them up either vertically or horizontally. It doesn't matter. But as long as they're lined up, they can't be lined up crisscross. And then all we have to do is solve for this. So again, we're going to cross multiply like this. And we're going to get 15x is equal to 60 times 6. And then divide both sides by 15. And we can simplify here, right? So 15 and 6 are both divisible by 3. So this becomes 5 and this becomes 2. And then 60 um, is also divisible by 5. So then um, 60 divided by 5 um, is going to get me to 12. And then my answer becomes 24. Okay, we got a geometry question. So they're telling us here that N and P are parallel lines. So when we're dealing with parallel lines, we have a lot of angles that are equal, right? So this is testing you guys on parallel lines like this, cut by a transversal. So you have exterior angles that are equal, and you're also going to have interior angles that are equal, all opposite angles, right? So there's a few things that we know. We know that vertical angles, angles are equal, right? So these are going to be equal. And then alternate interior. So the way that I always teach this is here's my interior, right? I'm shading my interior. Here's inside. Alternate ones are going to be equal. So on alternate sides of my transversal. So this is going to equal this. And then by vertical angle, also equal this. So all those angles that I marked right now are equal. And then alternate exterior angles are also equal. So my exterior is what I'm shading out here. So again, alternate on opposite sides of the transversal are going to be equal. So this angle is going to equal to this angle. And then these are also going to equal. Does that make sense? So we have alternate interior angles and alternate exterior angles. And then just for completion's sake, the other thing is we know that all straight angles are, are um, supplementary as well. Um, so we also know that, for example, this together is 180, this together is 180, this together is 180. I don't want to include that in the picture because it gets really messy, but all of those are also supplementary. That's also true. Okay, so now that we quickly reviewed that, let's see what we can apply to this question. So straight line M. So here's our transversal. And here are our two parallel lines. So when we're thinking about what's interior, this is interior. So then when we're thinking about which angles are equal, these here are my, are my alternate interior angles. So all of these are equal. And then these are my alternate exterior angles, which are all equal. So we marked it up for ourselves. Um, and then we have a right triangle here. So this is 73. This is marked as a right angle. We know that the sum of angles in a triangle is always 180. So the first thing that you guys should be able to solve for is this angle right here. Oops, this one right here. So the way that we solve for this angle right here is we're going to say 180 minus 90 minus 73. So 90 minus 73 is going to give me 17. So I know that this angle right here is 17 degrees. And then right after that, I can now solve for um, this angle. Because like I said, these are supplementary. So then I can do 180 minus 17. And that's going to give me 163. So I know that this here is 163. And that's it. I'm done.
And I know that R is 163. Does that make sense to everybody? The other way that you can do this even quicker is there's an um, idea that the exterior angle in a triangle is equal to the sum of the other two angles. So this right here is also equal to 163. That would save you time. It's called the exterior angle theory. Okay, let's keep going. We have another geometry question. They're giving us a parallelogram. They're giving us the length of the base, QT, um, sorry, the length of the height and the length of the base. So all we have to do to get the area is base times height. So this is a simple one, area is equal to base times height. So area is equal to 18 times 34. Um, like always, you guys should estimate, right? So if I estimate, if I think that this is about 20 and I estimated that up, must estimate this down, this is about 30. I get about 600. So here's my answer, quick, quick and dirty. I don't have to spend time sitting there doing 34 times um, 18. But the other thing that can help you is you can start this and you can see that your last digit is going to be a two. And then you can stop at that point too. You know, it's about 600. You know, your last digit is a two. That's pretty certain that you're on the right pace. Okay, next, we have Allison has five stamp albums with 576 stamps in each album. If she transfers her stamp collection to six albums, each holding 378 stamps, how many stamps will be left over? So she has five albums with 576 stamps in all. So first, let's figure out how many albums she has altogether. So we have five times 576. Um, so that tells me that she has in total 2,880 stamps. Then she's transferring to six albums with 378 stamps. So those six albums will hold 2,268 stamps. So how many will be left over is the difference between these. So we have 2,880 minus 2,268. We can start subtracting. We get a two. So I already know this and this are out. And then we continue to subtracting. We get a one. And I know this is my answer. Okay, next one, we're starting with this number and then we have to follow the steps. So we're gonna multiply by 10. So when we multiply by 10 with a decimal place, you always move your decimal place, just one unit to the right. So we end up with one, three, five, two point eight. Then if we add 0.5 to this step, we're going to get one, three, five, three point three. Then it says drop the digits after the decimal place. So this disappears and then divide by 10. So we get 135.3. Okay, let's keep going. I think we'll finish maybe this one more page and then I'll give you guys time to ask any questions um, at the end, okay? Okay, so we have x is negative two. What is this value? So what are these brackets called? What am I looking at? What is this? What is this testing? Yeah, good. This is absolute value. Excellent. So the thing about absolute value is the, the der derivation of it is like distance. That's why it can never be negative because you can't have a negative distance. So inside of here needs to be a positive number and inside of here needs to be a positive number. But does that mean that my answer automatically has to be positive? No, because I'm subtracting two positive numbers. And if this one happens to be bigger, I can still get a negative number. So sometimes students just see those absolute value brackets and they're like negative, 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 positive, done. You cannot do that. You can only do that if there was no this, right? If they just asked you, what's the value of this? Oh, I know it has to be positive and you can live live your life simply but you can't do that here because we're subtracting so within the absolute value has to be positive your final answer does not have to be positive so that's one thing so how are we going to solve this we're just going to plug in so we're going to say negative two plus negative two squared plus negative two cubed the absolute value of that so let's figure this out first so we have negative two plus negative two squared is four 
and negative two cubed is negative eight. Negative two plus four gives me two and two minus eight gives me negative six. And the absolute value of negative six is positive six. Cause like we said, inside the absolute value has to be a positive number. So we get the six. So now let's do the other half. So then we have negative two plus two times negative two plus three times negative two. We got six minus the absolute value of negative two minus four minus six. Six minus the absolute value of negative 12. And again, the absolute value of negative 12 is positive 12 because within the brackets always has to be positive. But six minus 12, we have no more absolute value. So our final answer is indeed negative six in this case. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay, three plus negative three. This becomes zero. I don't care about anything else because a zero in my denominator means the overall fraction has to be zero. So I don't care what this bottom number is. But if we want it to be complete, it's zero over six. But it doesn't matter because if my numerator is zero, I'm done. The answer is zero. So this is testing something called like the zero property of division. If we want to be very technical, but any zero divided by any number is always going to be zero, basically is what that's saying. And yet zero in the denominator becomes complicated. You guys will learn that in calculus. It's like an undefined situation, they won't ask you that on this test. But in the numerator, that's fair game and that's just become zero. Okay, um, what do they want here? They want 12.96 divided by 0 0.08. So I don't like decimals. So what I would do is I would make these whole numbers. I would say, okay, 1296 divided by eight. Um, and then we would do the division. So we would get one. Um, but the idea is if you already know here, it's not gonna be 1.62, it's not gonna be 16.2, that's too small. When you multiply eight by 1.62, there's no way that you're gonna get 1,296. And when you multiply 16 by eight, that's about 20 by eight, you're gonna get about 160. Um, so that's still too small. And then if you multiply eight by 1,620, this number is even bigger than this number. So that's too big. So you know that this is going to be our answer. So you don't really care that the actual values are 162. That's clear. All the answers have the same values. You just need an estimate of what part of the decimal place, like what term do you need to multiply by? And that's harder to do with these decimal places because it's harder for us to imagine those values because we don't work with them commonly. But if you convert to whole numbers and it's easier for us to think, okay, by what amount do I have to multiply this to get to the thousands? Okay, next they ask, what is the distance between the midpoints of MN and RS? So we got to use our midpoint formula. So first let's do MN. So how do we get the midpoint of MN? Um, so we would do seven minus one, which is six, and then divided by two, so that's three. So the midpoint of MN is three. And then the midpoint of RS is going to be six minus three divided by two. So that's going to be 1.5. Okay, so what does that mean? So that means that the midpoint of MN is three units away from either M or N. So I'm gonna start with M or N and I'm gonna go one, two, three or one, two, three, I end up in the same place. So here's my midpoint of MN. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for RS. I have to go one and a half. So one and a half in the same place here, one and a half, I end up in the same place. So here I am. So the distance between um, either of those is just half a unit. That's what they're asking at the end. Does that make sense to everybody? So when I do this halfway, it's three units away from M or N. This is 1.5 units away from R or S. 
And then you can see that both of them, those midpoints together are just half a unit apart. All right, and then these last ones, if S is positive and T is negative. Okay, so S is positive and T is negative. So what does that tell us? So S minus a negative value, what are we gonna have here? We're definitely gonna have a positive value for choice for principle one. Does that make sense? So this must result in a positive. Okay, next. We know that T is negative, so we're gonna have a positive times a negative squared. A negative squared is always gonna give us a positive. So this is gonna be a positive times a positive, which is definitely a positive. So, so far we know that one and two must be a positive number. So we can eliminate this and we can eliminate this. So now to get the right answer, we just need to figure out, okay, so is three, does three have to be positive or does three not have to be positive? So we have a positive integer to a negative exponent. So what I would do is I would plug a number. So let's say we have three to the negative second power. So how do I simplify this? So whenever you have three, any number to a negative exponent, you reciprocal and you make the exponent positive. So you reciprocal your base, I get one third, and you make the exponent positive. So that means that we're always going to get a positive value for the third one as well. And that's why our answer is this. Does that make sense to everybody? We're gonna because we can reciprocal this. This is let's just add negative, right? So we know what we're talking about. So this is gonna be one over s to the positive t power, which is always going to be a positive number. So a negative exponent doesn't mean a negative number, it just means reciprocal. All right, so we got through almost half of the math section, and we have about five minutes or so left. You guys can ask me any questions that you have about like any last minute topics or any questions about questions that we did together that you want a second explanation on or any personal questions on like specialized high schools or medicine or anything that you guys have for me at all. Um, anybody that has a um, another question that I don't get to or, or anything like with the notes or anything like that, I'm going to put my email in the chat one more time. Um, quadratics should not be on this test. Um, somebody said, can you review 65? You can multiply by one eighth here too. But then you're left with one over M. So let's say you do eight over M is equal to 16. You multiply by one eighth. That's okay, you can do that. So then here you end up with one over M is equal to two. And then you have to reciprocal to get your answer. So then you're going to get like m over one is equal to one over two. So you can do it that way too. You'll get the same answer. Um, yes, the topics covered um, on this test are pretty representative of the test. Any of the DOE exams are very close to what you'll see on test day. Okay, somebody wants me to repeat 83. Okay, so s to the t power. So you have a positive number to a negative exponent. The rule here is you reciprocal the positive number, you reciprocal your base, so we get one over a positive number, and you make your exponent positive. So you end up with a fraction raised to a positive number, which is always going to be positive. Does that make sense? And if you're ever confused, you should plug in numbers for yourself and see if you can disprove it. So three to the negative second, for example, becomes one third squared, which is just one ninth. Or 15 to the negative third becomes one over 15 cubed. Any numbers that you plug in and you follow the rule, you're always gonna get a positive number. So if you do that 10 times and it's positive, it's pretty good and that's it. Um, I would find that these questions are pretty similar to what you'll see on the exam. The Queller Prep specific exams can be more difficult than what's on the actual SHSAT, but for these, um, the DOE exams are pretty representative. Um, so what does homework look like? So I can tell you about Staten Island Technical High School, which is where I graduated from. Um, 
there is a focus on math and science. There's a lot of APs available. Um, so that's kind of like the, I think the biggest um, positive that you get from going to a specialized high school is um, you're taking a lot of AP classes um, and that can help you then in college because you get the college credits. But I will say that in my school, like they, we were focused on math and science and most people had an interest in math and science. And because of that, we had like cool classes like robotics being offered and like computer science and engineering in high school, which is pretty cool because most people are only exposed to that in college. But there were also like um, English classes. Um, I took like a bunch of like AP English classes, like language and composition and literature. I was also more interested in liberal arts. So I think there's really something for everything. I think just historically, the schools were more known for math and science, um, but but there are definitely like liberal arts programs in these schools as well. I graduated from Staten Island Technical High School. Uh, it's hard to talk about what a good score is because what happens is like they rank you. So the score cutoffs change every single year. Um, so I can't tell you guys like what the specific score is to get in because they change every single year. But what you could do is you can Google like last year's cutoffs or the years before that cutoffs and people have estimates of them um, because they never actually release them. But if you're curious and like what the numbers mean, that's what I would do. Um, I graduated from Macaulay Honors Brooklyn College and I'm currently a third year medical student at Downstate. Um, how much time would you spend on homework in a specialized high school? Um, yeah, like you do a lot of homework. It's honestly, like I'm pretty far removed from high school, um, but I remember coming home and doing a lot of homework. I was also involved in sports. Um, so like you, you, it is a pretty busy schedule, but I will say that it's very rewarding and it definitely um, prepares you for college. So that's one, like the biggest thing that I would say going to a specialized high school is I was prepared and over-prepared for college. Like I had absolutely no issues. In fact, I even thought that like my first year of college was easier. Um, my first two years of college were probably easier than high school. So it's a big benefit um, because going to college can be a big transition, especially if you move away from home and all that. Um, but being prepared academically um, is really helpful. Um, not true. You don't have to get above 600. You, you go off the cutoff scores. Um, cutoff scores stay pretty close year to year, um, but not exact. Um, there's no humanities-based specialized high schools, but they all do have humanity programs. Um, and I was very um, interested in like language and English um, when I was in high school and I ended up being a, a sociology major. Uh, I do remember my score just because I was so excited, um, but they don't give you it out of 114. So you don't know how many questions you got wrong or right. Um, you just get a score out of 800. Um, do you have any tips on what to do if you don't finish the test in time? So first of all, you want to avoid that happening, right? So now is the time to sort of um, give yourself strategies to avoid not finishing the test on time. You guys get the advantage of you can start with any section that you want. Um, so I would start with the section that I'm good at and I would finish it as soon as possible to make sure that I'm getting all the points that I'm good at like in. And then you also have extra time for the section that you are uh, worse at. Um, and then the other thing is if you're really running out of time, you can employ all these little estimation tricks that I taught you guys about. Uh, we talked about like when it's okay to skim and how to work a little bit faster through the reading comprehension passages in um, the previous lesson. And I'll do that a little bit more next Thursday when we talk about grammar. So all of that can help you work more efficiently in terms of time. Um, but then lastly, if you do all of those things and, and it happens, you run out of time anyways, I would say bubble in whatever choice you want, people say C works, um, just guess, fill something in um, because you're gonna get just as penalized for a wrong answer, for a blank answer. At least you're giving yourself that one fourth chance that some of those are gonna be correct. Um, at the end of the day, you have to be a good test taker and get the maximum amount of points possible. Okay, I'm getting a bunch of your emails. So after this lesson, I'll reply back. Um, with the notes, it might take a few time, a few minutes for the recording to be ready if you guys want me to send that as well. So just be patient. Um, and then if you don't hear from me and you don't get the notes, um, just send it again. Um, don't send me your email. If you want the notes, just email me right now and say, hey, send me the notes. And I'll reply back to it after the lesson. 
How do you stay focused without getting distracted? This is a really, really important question. Um, you have to build stamina. So when you're studying, you want to start with, okay, I'm going to focus for 20 minutes today. And then the next day you do 30 minutes. And the next day you work up to an hour and gradually, gradually, gradually you build your stamina. You guys should be able to sit down and take a full three hour practice test. That should be comfortable for you. The first time that you sit down for three hours and focus on a test should not be on the day of your exam. And the stamina will build over time. Like the SAT is a little bit longer. When you guys take like graduate exams, like if you go into medicine, you take the MCAT or if eventually you take your boards, those exams are close to seven hours. So it's not something that happens over time. You have to build your stamina gradually. And the more practice tests that you do, the more often that you do them, the more your brain will be used to focusing for those amounts of time. You also have to fuel yourself. So I'm a person that hates eating before exams because I get really nervous, but our brain runs off of glucose, off of sugar. So you absolutely have to eat at least something, force yourself. Um, and we'll do all of these like last minute sort of like good luck strategies um, uh, the sun next Sunday. Um, I talked about annotating and reading comprehension last Thursday. Um, and we talked a little bit about poetry last Thursday. So if you guys want that, um, again, just send me an email and I can send you the notes from that. Um, and we'll finish like poetry because I only did half of it. So we'll finish that po practice poem um, on Thursday and then we'll do grammar. And then the last Sunday, we'll just do like stress relieving techniques and any questions that you guys have. Last minute questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, anything else? Okay. Bye guys. Um, anybody that has questions, I'll stay on. Other than that, I'll see you guys hopefully on Thursday. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Should be really nice today, like 70 degrees. Um, which questions would come up most where we have to memorize formulas? So anything with geometry, you need to know all your formulas for like volume, area, um, circumference, all that stuff, um, all the angle stuff, um, like sum of angles, all of that is just like, you need to have those things memorized. Um, I think those are the main ones. And then the ratio triangles, which we reviewed. All right, guys, I'll see you next week. I'm going to end the lesson now and then I'll email whoever um, emailed me the notes. Bye.